All right, okay. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Heavenly Father, thanks so much uh, for our community of believers. And Lord, thank you so much for just the fellowship and the love that we share. It comes from you, Lord. And we just uh, lift this time up to you now. And we ask you to bless us now as we open your word. And we look into it to find the wisdom and the grace that you have for us. And Lord, we just ask you to be with us now. Uh, let this be a time of your blessing on us. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Okay, are we on? Okay, so I am not on, am I? Yeah, yeah you're on. Oh. All right, okay. All right. So, um, all right, this is the second class uh, that we have, uh, uh, that we're looking at uh, the book of Mark. And um, I want to briefly, briefly review uh, where we've been, and then we'll move forward. Uh, into today's lesson. So very, very briefly, last week we looked at two things essentially. We looked at an introduction to the book of Mark, kind of historical uh, type of thing, and then we looked at uh, some of the first chapter of Mark. And this is, this is what we uh, uh, did last week. We looked at who Mark was, and I still have these scriptures up here, but Mark is very well identified in the New Testament, uh, not only uh, in uh, the Gospel, but also in Acts, the epistles of Paul, and uh, in, in Peter, okay? And so we have a very well identified author. Uh, the second thing, remember, the, the reason why that's important is there's so much criticism today about the authority of Scripture and whether or not uh, Scripture describes things that really happened in history or whether or not it's made up, okay? Secondly, uh, we looked at the book itself, that it's vivid, and it really does. As one commentator says, it sparkles or really pops off the pages. It's very tight and compact, 16 chapters. We're going to get through them in eight weeks. And it's moving in two ways. It's moving quickly, but it's also moving of the heart. And we're going to look a little bit at how it moves the heart today with uh, Jesus' compassion. Okay? And then we uh, broadly looked at the purpose uh, of Mark, the overall purpose. A lot of people have said different things, as you can imagine, because it's so complete. The only thing that Mark kind of misses is the birth of Jesus. But it goes all the way through his ministry very quickly, leaves out some big things, for perhaps like the Sermon on the Mount and stuff. That's okay. But then the last three chapters are all about the passion of Christ. So, so essentially... Uh, we get a, uh, a book that moves along and is complete. And we looked at the purpose of it, and that is it displays Christ's servanthood, and it displays to us how important it is to have faith and devotion in Christ. All right? And then we looked at essentially uh, the herald. John the Baptist, okay, proclaiming the way of a king, of a king, not just proclaiming the way of anybody, but proclaiming the way of a king. Only kings were preceded by heralds, okay? And so what we have from that first, from the kind of first half of the first chapter is the preparation for the king. Now, what we're going to do today, believe it or not, is we can try to get all the way through the end of chapter 3. Now, we're not going to do this in all of it uh, in great detail, okay? We're going to do some of it in, in detail, all right? But we're going to try to finish with the first chapter of Mark and get all the way through uh, the end of chapter 3 because we have to keep moving. And these are the two th things that I want you to look for, these two themes. Okay, I want you to look for the compassion of Christ. It's part of his servanthood. All right, the compassion of Christ. Am I on the camera? 
Way over here? Okay. Uh, and the second thing that really stands out in chapter 2 is Christ establishing his authority. Who is he? And how does he do this? All right. And is he, is there something unique and special about him? All right. So, so those are the two things that we want to look for. Jesus is compassion and Jesus is authority. So let's go ahead and open our Bibles back to uh, chapter 1. And where we want to start is Mark 140. And this is what we're going to do today. We are going to look at some passages that you, all of you, are very well familiar with. These are some of the uh, most well-known passages in the Bible. So none of this is going to be foreign to any of you, all right? And perhaps the teaching isn't either. But once again, whenever we open God's Word, you may have heard these things a million times, but we want God's Word to have a positive and beneficial and godly effect on us, okay? And so let's, let's go ahead and leap into 140. And this is... Uh, the account of uh, a leper and Jesus healing a leper, okay? And so there's something that I want you to pull out of this and it's Christ's compassion. And we're going to see this throughout each of the accounts that we look at today. So in 140, it starts, a man with leprosy. Now, this is the beginning of Jesus' ministry, okay? A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you are willing, you can make me clean, okay? And so the next verse should not be overlooked, and I'm afraid that many, many times it is. And what it does, it essentially sets up the reason why Jesus took the action that he did. The next verse in 41 says, Jesus filled with compassion, reached out his hand and touched the man. Just reached out his hand and touched the man. And he responded to this leper. And the response is, I am willing. Remember the leper's question, if you are willing. And Jesus, there's this connection there. It's this connection that isn't really found in a lot of these healing passages where this particular hurting individual, remember leprosy, it was essentially decay of the extremities. These people were banished, and so it's important that Jesus reached out and touched them. All right? So Jesus does something that essentially you wouldn't do. He reached out and touched. This is essentially a decaying, grotesque man. All right? And immediately he healed him, and he did so because of compassion. All right? Now, what I want us to do is look at this because a lot of times uh, we look at these accounts, but we forget Jesus' heart. All right? And the reason for it is because of the other thing we're going to look at It's all of this conflict that's going on with the Pharisees and the scribes and everything. Because of that conflict, it kind of overshadows at times the heart of Christ. And so I just want us to real briefly look at some other places that we are well familiar with that the motivating factor for Christ is compassion. Now, there may be some other things involved, proving his authority and the like, but compassion. So, let's go ahead and look at, uh, just very briefly, we're going to go through a few things. Matthew 9.36. We're going to look at Matthew a little bit here. And if if you take a look at Matthew 9.36, you'll see that in 35 it starts, Jesus went through all the towns and the villages, teaching in their uh, synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Remember, the preaching and the teaching comes first. Okay? When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them 
because they were harassed, helpless, and they were like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest. Okay? The reason why Jesus is moved to send disciples to the helpless is out of compassion. It, it, this is godly. This is overwhelming. This is more compassion than the great compassion people that we know, like Mother, let's just say Mother Teresa. Okay? This is godly, overwhelming passion. And, and, and I don't want us to overlook this because this is the God that we, that we have. We have an extremely, extremely compassionate uh, Lord. Let's go ahead and take a look at um, uh, 14, Matthew 14, 14. Another really well-known passage. <clears throat> it's where Jesus fi- feeds the 5,000. Now, we all know this miracle. It's a great miracle because he multiplies just a very small number of fish and loaves into something big. But if you take a look at, and I'm at 14.13, when Jesus heard what had happened, by the way, this was the uh, beheading of uh, John the Baptist. That's what happened. When Jesus heard that John the Baptist was beheaded, he withdrew by boat privately to a, private, to a solitary place. All right. Hearing of this, though... The crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw the large crowds, he had compassion on them and he healed the sick. Now here's a man who essentially is mourning, mourning the death of uh, this significant person in his life. Hugely significant. And he is harried by the crowd constantly throughout his ministry, right until the end. Remember what crowds, remember, crowds are still there at the end. They just say crucify and crucify. Okay? But harried by the crowds the entire, the entire time, and he makes time for them, and he has so much compassion that he heals them. So we're, what, we're, what we have, the benefit as Christians of, of having is a, a, a God, a Savior, that's never, ever too busy for us. Ever. And uh, sometimes I think this is lost on us in Scripture. We'll look at, at one more here uh, in Matthew twenty thirty four. There were uh, blind men. So in 29, as Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And they called out, Jesus, uh, a son of David, have mercy on us. And the crowd rebuked them, told them, push them away. It's amazing. And they called out again. And Jesus stopped and said, what do you want me to do for you? So once again, you can see the scenario again. All of this commotion. And they answered, we want our sight. And Jesus, why did Jesus do it? It's because Jesus had compassion on him. Right in 34, immediately they received their sight and followed him. And so as we move forward through here, I want you to see that this Jesus, the servant, the servanthood of Christ, is that he is never, ever too busy. Now, there are times when he rebukes, uh, but, but there are, you know, but those are for reasons. Jesus is never too busy for our infirmities, whatever they are, okay? Uh, and I say that, infirmities of the mind, infirmities of the body, and infirmities of the heart. Jesus is never too busy, and he's never unable to heal. And uh, so um, what I want to do from here is I want us to 
uh, briefly move from there. Just, just one moment. I want us to move to. I've lost it. I've lost it. We'll uh, we'll get there. I'll, I'll get there. Uh, but I'm, I'm I'm moving around in the scripture too much. So let's go ahead now. Go back to math. Uh, go back to the book of Mark, and um, uh, move into uh, chapter two. All right. Now, we're looking, we're going to continue to look at the compassion of Christ. Okay? Because this is all throughout. You can't miss the compassion of Christ. It, it, is, it is all throughout the gospel. But what I want us now to kind of change to is to look at the authority of Christ. And Christ establishing his authority. All right? And so... <clears throat> Here's the, the thing. Up until now, Jesus has done a couple things. He's actually cast a demon out, which we looked at last week. Okay? And uh, he's healed this leper. But he hasn't really been questioned about it in this gospel uh, yet. We're only in the first chapter. Okay? He's done it out of compassion, and he's moved along. But this type of thing, think about it. This really happened. Christ was a real man amongst real crowds, and there were real religious authorities and real governmental authorities. And when that type of thing happens, when somebody is acting in such a way as to call attention to himself in somewhat of a controversial way, not very long, before people start asking questions. Right? And that is... Largely, what the second chapter is about. And so, there are going to be some very familiar stories we're going to look at. We're going to look at the paralytic being let down through the roof of the house. We all know that story. All right? We're going to look at the calling of Levi slash Matthew. Matthew the Apostle, uh, Levi the Apostle, the tax collector. Okay? And we're going to look at Jesus and his disciples eating grain uh, uh, on, on, on the Sabbath. We're going to look at these things. And we're going to look at them from a point of Jesus' authority. Okay? So let's go into the second chapter of Mark. A few days later, all right, <clears throat> Jesus again entered Capernaum. Now this is very interesting. We all know that Jesus is Jesus of, of what? Of where? Jesus of Nazareth. Nobody ever says Jesus of Capernaum. All right? But his early ministry took place around Capernaum. And I, I don't have, uh, well, I do in the back of my Bible, but it doesn't do us any good. Uh, you all may have some maps in the back of your Bible, or you can look up uh, maps. But, uh, but what you'll find is that Capernaum is a, a, a little port town on the Sea of Galilee, okay? It's on the, the Lake of Galilee. The sea of Galilee is not a very big thing, all right? It's a lake. It's full of fish, and that fish really kind of supported uh, uh, the people in the area, okay? And Capernaum was a town on the Sea of Galilee. And so when we hear of Jesus being in Galilee... He is generally working out of Capernaum, this town. So, uh, and that is much of the first part of his ministry. He then moves down south, and we'll see this, down to the Dead Sea and Jerusalem area later, and all right, and Judea, Judea. Uh, but for the beginning of his ministry, he's he's up north. All of this within kind of many days walking distance. Remember. But he's up north uh, in Capernaum slash Galilee. And so, in two it says, a few days later, Jesus entered Capernaum. 
all right? The people heard uh, that he had come home. I don't want to get into that. Essentially, he was raised in Nazareth, but he made his, I'm going to say, for lack of a better term, it's not a very good term, his headquarters around the area of Capernaum. So many gathered, again, again, many gathered that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. So he's in a home. Some people think it could have been his mother's home. Some people think it could have been Peter's home. It doesn't really matter, all right? Uh, and some men came, and they were bringing a paralytic. So, so look, we went from a demon-possessed man last week in chapter 1. Now, I want you to think about this. That, that demon-possessed man wasn't a demon. He was a man, okay, who had a demon in him. And he was probably... Um, had convulsions. It's a really bad thing. Then we went next to a leper. It's a really bad thing, okay? These are some of the worst of the worst. You know, in order to get worse back then, you just died, okay? These are the living. These are those who, who are surviving. And, and now we have a paralytic. Now, now think about this. I don't know. I mean, I would imagine because there was so little health care back then that there were a lot of broken, physically broken people out there. I, I mean, there had to have been, but I would also imagine most of them died. And when you think about this, a paralytic, think about this, this is spinal injury. This is spinal injury. And you know today how difficult it is for someone with a spinal injury to survive. You see them. They're in wheelchairs, they're motorized now and everything, and they're having difficulty surviving. Well, think about it back then. This, this is a man who is in very, very bad of physical straits. And so what happens is this man somehow or another has four friends, and that's probably the way that he survived. Okay, he has four friends. And some men came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four of them. And since they could not get to Jesus because of the crowd that was packed into this house, all right, somehow or another, they got this man on a stretcher or a pallet on the roof. And then they started peeling away the roof. Start peeling it away. Now, we don't know the backstory on this. We don't know the backstory. But when you think about this, this is a big endeavor because they have to create a hole large enough to fit a man horizontally through this hole on ropes down to Jesus. This is not just some small hole. Okay? And I don't want to go off into how the roofs were built and stuff like that, okay? But they, they, let, him, they let him down into Jesus. It, it's somewhat of a funny thing because if they're peeling away the roof, you'd think the roof would be caving in for those people down below. Somehow or another, they get him down in, and... Uh, when Jesus saw their faith, when Jesus saw their faith, okay, you can't just see the man, he saw the faith of the paralytic and those friends of his. It was an amazing faith. They didn't know what Jesus was going to do, right? This is all kind of a gamble. Jesus said something very surprising. What did he say? Did he say, did he do the same thing he did to the leper. What did he, what did he do, Evelyn? He said something strange. But it's actually something earth-shaking. He said, your sins are forgiven. All right? <clears throat> Why is that controversial? Only God can forgive sins. Only God can forgive sins. What's the second reason it's controversial? And the sins caused the paralysis. 
Well, that's one thing. That is one thing, Sandy. Yes. There's a question whether or not had the sin caused the paralysis. Okay. I don't really want to get off into that, but there, the second reason that I'm looking for is that nobody knows whether or not someone's sins are forgiven. And so while God is the only one who can forgive sins, Carl can say to me, Bruce, your sins are forgiven, and whether they are or not, none of us are going to know. And that's exactly the point that the Pharisees make amongst themselves. Now, I want you to look at this. This is the first kind of challenge to Jesus. Right? The first public challenge to Jesus. And so, <clears throat> Jesus says, Son, your sins are forgiven. And in 6, <clears throat> Mark 2, verse 6, Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does the fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Well, he is. All right? He is. If he's just a man. Okay? Who can forgive sins but God alone? This is exactly what you guys said. And immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And so he answered a question that actually was not given to him publicly. He answers this question. He kind of preempts them, okay? And he says, why are you thinking these things? Not why are you asking these questions. Why are you thinking these things? Which is it easier to do? To say to a paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat, and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I tell you, get up, take your mat, and walk. And the paralytic got up, and he took his mat, and he walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone, and they praised God, saying, we have never seen anything like this. Okay. Now, how do you think that the fair, well, I want to say the, the teachers, how do you think that the religious authorities then looked at this? This is a challenge, correct? They, they perceive Jesus as, number one, some sort of magician, Number two, some sort of fraud. Or number three, perhaps real. Now, if he's real, that's either a good thing or a bad thing. It's a good thing because maybe this Messiah has returned. But it's a bad thing because it's a challenge to their, their establishment. Okay? Now, there's one other very, very significant thing that Christ says in this passage. And what is it? Suzanne? Christ's authority. Christ's authority, but what, what is it? What does he say? What does he call himself? Son of man. Son of man. All right? So, does anybody, I'm sure you do. We've all studied uh, the Gospels before. Tell me what you know a little bit about the Son of Man. What's that? Exactly. It's exactly, JC. It's a reference from Daniel. So let's go ahead and turn to Daniel 7, 13, and 14. Now, before we get into this, I want to, just a couple little things that I've, I've read. Uh, Jesus is the only person that calls himself the Son of Man. Uh, uses this term for himself. So he actually uses this term for himself. And it, it, he actually uses it in the four Gospels 81 times. For those who are keeping books of lists and statistics and things like that, it's a very, very common thing. He uses the term for himself about 14 times in the book of Mark itself. Okay? But why is this so earth-shattering? And if you take a look at Daniel... Um, this is Daniel's vision. 
It's about uh, the consummation. And um, if you look at 713, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Now you wonder, you wonder what a son of man is. It's, it's obviously a man, all right? But it's a, it uh, is a very special man. The son of man, he... All right, let me go back. Uh, the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. So approaching with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. And then in 14, all right, he was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All na- peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. And his dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Now, this is a description of the Messiah. Now, just in reading those, can anybody kind of um, uh, uh, perhaps just expand or perhaps discuss some of these describers that are in here about him? Go ahead, just take a shot. What? What, what's being described about the Son of Man? Give us the context. When I, when I was a baby Christian, and we're, we're about the same age, so I was first taught back in the, the days of the Good News, New Testament, and all of that, that this was, this was Christ kind of reveling in his humility by calling himself Son of Man and I'm identifying with a boy for boy and all of that. Mm. At some point, how kind of Someone referenced me to this passage yeah. in Daniel, and I realized, no, it's just the opposite. Exactly. E- exactly, J.C. I mean, he possesses all authority in heaven and earth, just like the Great Commission. Exactly. So for the, uh, uh, for the video, J.C. says that he possesses all authority in heaven and earth. Right? And, and that's exactly it. But who... And, and so... Who will worship him? In this passage, who will worship him? Is it just the Israelites? All men of all nations. Now that's kind of odd because we're talking about a Messiah that's going to come back for the, basically to save the Israelites, but he is going to be worshipped by all men of all nations, which essentially absolutely foreshadows and supports the rest of the New Testament and our lives today. Okay? And so we're grafted in as Gentiles to the Son of Man and to, uh, uh, to His authority over all heaven and earth. And so I want us now to turn to, because this is in the, the Old Testament, I want us to turn to Revelation 1.12. And go ahead and look at John, who, like Daniel, sees something in a vision, very similar, and says in 12, at the very beginning... I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven uh, gold lampstands, and among the lampstands was someone like a son of man. Uh, To tell you the truth, that kind of sends shivers up my spine. Uh, There's some sort, something very profound about that, and then this description, and he's dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet, so he's priestly, And with a gold sash around his chest, his head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were blazing like fire, and his feet bronze glowing in a furnace. So this son of man is essentially God. In his right hand he held the stars and a double-edged sword. And down in 17, when I saw him, I fell at his feet. He had to fall on his feet. He had to go prostate. As though dead, then he placed his right hand on me. And he said, do not be afraid. 
Why not do be why do not be afraid? Why not do not be afraid? Because of what we just looked at. We serve a compassionate Son of Man, a compassionate all authority of heaven and earth. It's so Christly, like Jesus, to reach down and say, Don't be afraid. I am the essence of everything, the Alpha and Omega, but don't be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the Alpha and Omega. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. Now, that had not been written when Jesus said those words that we're looking at in Mark, in Capernaum. But the Daniel passage had been written. And the teachers were well aware of the reference of the Son of Man to essentially being the Messiah, being God. And so, Jesus, there's two things that happen. Jesus asserts his authority and the establishment starts to push back at this point. And this is kind of the theme of chapter 2. So what I want you to do, let's move back from Revelation back to Mark. Yes, Suzanne. The Daniel passage about all peoples, nations, languages and, uh, should serve him. Um, Revelation 5 9, you know, talks about um, by your blood you ransom people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. Yes. So that's just kind of another. A parallel there. Right. And Suzanne brought up the fact that in Revelation 5, Christ ransoms. Uh, people from every tribe and nation, which is as parallel. Um, and so, what we find then, as as we move along, is uh, he now is challenged again by uh, the uh, religious establishment in a very different way. And this is in associating with sinners. I, I love that term. Because, of course, we're, we are all that. All of us. And so, in uh, verse 13, chapter 2, once again, Jesus went uh, beside the lake. And once again, once again, a large crowd gathered. And he began to teach them. Now, you know, I want us to get back to what we said about the kingdom of God, because we have all these references to Jesus' teaching. But in many places, it does not say what he's teaching. And so I'm going to suggest something to you. We don't have the Sermon on the Mount here, but I think that it's safe to assume that Jesus' teachings fall in line with the Sermon on the Mount. They fall in line with the parables that we're about ready to read in later chapters. And they, but they all point to the coming kingdom of God. This transformed kingdom that will include all, not just the children of Israel, and will require faith in him in order to be saved. And this redemptive plan, all right, uh, which essentially um, will consummate in the salvation of the world. And so, so just keep that in mind. What is Jesus teaching? He's teaching all of those things. And we'll, we'll, there's a, a reference to that in, in the next uh, section. But 
Uh, so Jesus is teaching again amongst many people, and as he walked along, he saw Levi, or Matthew, uh, sitting in a tax collector's booth, and he says, follow me. And Levi got up and followed him. Now, we all know this, and I don't want to go into it, but tax collectors were um, loathed. They were loathed in uh, uh, society. They were seen as being in with the oppressors, uh, the Romans, and doing the Romans' dirty work. At any rate, and while Je- and, and so Jesus, uh, Levi, Levi got up and followed him as a disciple. He's a believer. And by the way, this Levi Matthew is the same guy who wrote the first gospel. So we, we have somebody who is profoundly transformed here. And so while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, and Levi probably had a good-sized house and a lot of furniture, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with these uh, disciples, uh, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him uh, eating with sinners and tax collectors, they said, why does he eat with sinners? All right, and so, you know, you can see the picture here. It doesn't look good. I'm, I'm just telling you. It, it doesn't look good. It wouldn't look good to us. I, I must say, uh, I don't want to use this to get myself in trouble here, but we have to watch whether or not we're being pharisaical. It, it just is, okay? We love our established religion. I don't just mean us, Presbyterians, Reformed. I, I mean bigger than that. As, as evangelicals, uh, we love... We love the law here. I want to make sure everybody is abiding by uh, uh, and not sinning and all. And, and, so, and so when we have to be, uh, we will, we, this could look bad to us. That's the point I'm, I'm saying. My gosh, here's our, this great religious teacher, and he's not, he is quite down in there with the worst of society. Okay. Well, that's an example for us. And it's probably one that we don't carry out very well. Okay? And it's, it's to not be one who's on the outside looking and criticizing, but it's one to be in. And there's a lot of different ways to do that, and I, I don't want to, to get too far afield on that. But... Jesus, again, heard or perceived the criticism, and he said, it is not the healthy you need a doctor, but it's the sick. I just, I just love that. I have not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. The second sentence explains the metaphor of the first. The metaphor is, I'm not here for, it's a hospital kind of, kind of metaphor, okay? The the healthy don't need me. The sick need me. What does that mean? What does that mean? Well, it means this. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. All right? Now, remember this. It's the paradox of Christ. The first shall be last, and the last shall be first. The healthy, essentially, are going to be last. The humble, the humble-hearted, the meek, are going, and the hurting, and, and those that trust in Christ, and not in their own righteousness, are going to be first. It, it, is, it is such a paradox. And it's all throughout the Scripture. And it applies to the Israelites some, but it also applies to us. Because the Israelites thought that they had their ticket in because they had been circumcised and were a circumcised family. And that's essentially what it took. And the Pharisees kind of overlaid that with a lot of very unnecessary rules. But when Jesus came to fulfill the law, he didn't only come to say that the Pharisees were wrong, But the Israelite, the Jewish scheme of relying on the law or circumcision is what was wrong. He came to turn that on its head. Okay? And so, 
in Jewish eyes, uh, in Pharisees' eyes, almost everybody was a sinner if they weren't following the Pharisaical laws. So, so Jesus comes for the sinner, right? For the sinner, and that's that. He is speaking to Israelites here, but he is meaning, we know this, vastly more. All right? So, now, that has to do with Christ's authority. And we're going to get into this next. And the next is Christ's authority and the Sabbath. So, the next uh, vignette, we'll say is that Jesus is questioned about not fasting, essentially. All right? My heading says him questioned about fasting, but he's questioned about not fasting. Now, I want you to look at, once again, the way Christ turns things around. Now, John's disciples and Pharisees were fasting. Now, nobody really knows why. A little background here. John the Baptist's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Why were they fasting? The Pharisees actually, a good Pharisee fasted twice a week. But John the Baptist's disciples weren't Pharisees. Okay? So the question is, why were they fasting? No one really knows. It could have been that John now was in prison and they were fasting because of that. And because of Christ's close association with them, he was expected to be fasting as well. All right? And so he's asked, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered this way. And it's not a direct answer. It's a kind of a, a, um, a sideways answer. Uh, it's kind of... Um, uh, what's the term I'm looking for? At the ends of the military line. The what? Flank. The flank. Thank you. It's a flank. It's an assault on the flank. Thank you so much, Deborah. All right. And so Jesus answers this way. How can the, how, how can the guests of the bride, bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot so long as they have them with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. And on that day, they will fast. Now, I want to stop there. I want to talk about Jesus' authority. He had, just previously, perhaps a couple days earlier, called himself the Son of Man. And now he's saying, look, I am not going to observe this particular Sabbath practice for whatever it was because I'm the bridegroom. And the bridegroom's attendants don't fast in his presence. Now, some of us here were fortunate enough to be with the bridegroom last night. Olivia Rooker and Cole, what's Cole's last name? Well, well, Hoff. Well, Hoff were married in this church. And they had a reception over at Chanel Country Club. And I, I want to tell you something. While the bride and the bridegroom were present, there was a celebration going on. No fasting. Okay? No fasting. There was no fasting. Instead, there was feasting, as there should have been. In fact, there was so much celebration that the rules about the uh, mass and stuff were somewhat put aside. I don't, I don't want to... I, I'm, I'm on video here, and I don't want to implicate anybody. But it was fun, and there was a celebration. There was joy at that celebration because the bridegroom was present. <clears throat> and guess what? When the bridegroom and bride left, it ended. Okay? It ended. All right? Now couple of things here. Um, let's go ahead and look at, uh, let me get to, my, let me get to my notes here. I've gotten ahead of myself. 
Let's go ahead and look at John 15, 9 through 11. Our relationship with Christ is to be a relationship of joy. I think we all know that, but sometimes it's a burden. Our relationship with Christ should be like this. It is John 15, 9 through 11. As the Father has, this is the words of Jesus, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now uh, remain in my love. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed the Father's commands and remain in His love. I have told you this so that my joy may be with you and that your joy may be complete. All right? If we are obedient to Christ, and I'm going to say is if we have given our lives over to Christ and we remain in Him, it should be a... A life of joy, and this, this, this would be a full, our lives would be full of joy, all right? Just like Olivia and Cole. Now, I realize that that's, that doesn't always work that way, and I realize that there are scriptures that talk about the cross that we must bear, and the burden, and the sacrifice, and the persecution. I got that. But underneath it all, there is this profound joy. Because here's the thing for us. The bridegroom has not left. The bridegroom has not left our wedding. The bridegroom is right here in our hearts. And we still have him with us. And there's a lot of different ways to look at this. We can look at it from the bridegroom, and the bride as being the church. But we can look at it personally, our own personal joy as well. And I think it's important that what Christ is saying here is uh, that more temporally uh, that he is of course uh, the consecrated bride, uh, bride. And he will temporarily be leaf crucified. But until that time, there is reason for joy, even if his disciples don't realize it. And he then goes on, and uh, we'll wrap up here in about five minutes then goes on with two small kind of parables. They're kind of metaphors. And some commentators think that they were well-known uh, idioms of the day. And the first is uh, that um, a, essentially a patch on a garment should be shrunk before it's applied to the garment, because if it's not, now remember, we didn't have pre-shrunk shrunk Levi jeans back then, okay? If you don't shrink it first, it's going to tear away from the garment when it gets wet. And the second is somewhat the same thing when it comes to wine skins. If you take new wine, which is essentially grape juice, and you put it into a, 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 an unexpanded, an unexpanded, I'm sorry, an, expand, an already expanded, an old uh, wine skin, and it ferments and expands to the gases, that old wine scene at first, just as the garment would tear. Now, what, that, that is not an easy, um, it, 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 it's not an easy parallel uh, for what Jesus is talking. It's not something that's easy to grasp. What, what is he talking about here? What is Christ, what's the point in these two little metaphors? What's his point? It's not real easy. He is, he is the new patch or the new wineskin. Okay? He, and coming on into the old. Okay? And the old ways of observing, in this case, observing these fasts. The Pharisees laid fast upon fast upon fast on them. 
uh, and even outside of the Pharisee world, there was a lot of fasting that was added by the Israelites. And it's all lawful. It's all observance of the law. And remember, and, the, and so the Sabbath is, of course, we deal with the whole Sabbath thing. We have dealt with it here at the Covenant. What he is saying is there is a new paradigm now. It's a new paradigm. Okay? And it even applies to observances of the Sabbath. Remember, what they were breaking was this uh, Pharisaical rule, which uh, you should not reap grain, reap grain on the Sabbath day. And they were eating grain. Okay? And I want to go now... And again, I want to come down to uh, uh, 23, and it, it's essentially the, 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 the Sabbath uh, again. The, the first was about fasting. The second is about, I'm sorry, I'm being uh, somewhat confusing. In 18, the account is about uh, fasting, and in 23, the account is about the Sabbath. But when Jesus wraps up the account about the Sabbath, he says the Sabbath was not made for man. I'm sorry. The Sabbath was made for man, not made for the Sab- not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man of man is the Lord even of the Sabbath. And so Jesus is taking the rules of fasting and the rules of the Sabbath. And he's saying about both of those, saying about both of those, the Son of Man, or Christ now, or the Messiah in the, in the kingdom of God is establishing new rules. There's a new paradigm. The kingdom of God is near. And you're not going to be saved by these small observances. And I'm not trying to take away from uh, the Ten Commandments, uh, the commandment on the Sabbath. Very important, phase of Sabbath. But I am giving credit to Jesus for putting this right, for putting it all right in the way that it's observed. All right? And so the rules are no longer the focus, the Pharisaical rules. Christ is the focus of our lives. It is Christ and the kingdom of God. So let's go ahead and stop there um, and just take away these two things from chapter 2. Jesus is compassion and Jesus establishing his authority. In the end, temporally, the Pharisees and the authorities will win. But in the end, Jesus is victorious. We're going to move on to chapter 3 next week. Um, <laughs> we didn't even make 3. We'll very quickly, very quickly, 3 is short. And we'll move on to chapter 4 next week and look at uh, the, uh, some of the parallels of, of uh, Christ. Any questions before we close? Ellen, yeah, have Ellen? you been watching The Chosen? No. You saw this lesson? Well, comfort. Well, you need to teach me about this. <laughs> but to see the compassion of Jesus and his authority and how relatable he was as the son of man, I have never seen a video that showed it like that. That's good. Jesus was just so relatable yep. and, and normal as a man. Yep. And I think in most videos that Kind of out there. Mm-hmm. But this is, is just so relatable. That's a good point. And for the video, I don't know if you can hear what Evelyn's saying is Jesus was so relatable to the regular person. And as you, as you take a look at this, that's why commentators think that these two idioms about the wineskin and the patch were well known at the time. And they would have been applicable. He is speaking in their language. Okay? And so he... 
that, that's a very, very good point, uh, Evelyn. I appreciate that. So let's go ahead and close the prayer. Heavenly Father, thanks so much for blessing us. And Lord, uh, we do uh, ask you to give us the strength to, to trust. Trust Christ. Trust that Christ is going to be compassionate to us. And trust, indeed trust, that Christ is over all heaven and earth and all of our infirmities and situations. Lord, as we walk out of here into worship, we just ask you to give us hearts to worship you. In Jesus' name, Father. Amen.